Howdy folks, Dave here at Thunder Mesa Studio, where you might notice the lighting is a little bit different today. It might be a little dimmer. Uh, I'm not sure how it's going to look in the camera, but that's because uh, I'm in the middle of upgrading all of the lighting as part of the revamp, reimagining of Thunder Mesa 2.0. But that is not the topic for today's video. Today we're going to be doing another structure build for the O-Scale 18-inch gauge, that's O and 18 to you and me, Bandit Canyon Railway. And this is the area I want to be working on. This is a little shelf of rock that sticks out over the track, kind of overhangs it. This is known as Robber's Roost on the Bandit Canyon. And I want to build a little cabin to sit up there. And I love starting out in the morning with a fresh batch of laser cut parts. Uh, I just uh, designed these yesterday and cut them this morning just for a little wooden shack. This is some uh, 1 16th of an inch thick basswood plywood. Then we've got some MDF parts for the roof trusses. And I'm using a, a fine tooth razor saw going with the grain. And this is just to uh, make it a little bit more weathered, make the grain a little bit more pronounced. And I have some um, uh, black shoe dye mixed with India ink. A lot of people ask about this wood stain recipe. It's really, really simple. I'm going to give it to you one more time. <laughs> you just get a bottle of this uh, black shoe dye, pour all of it out into another container, save it because you're probably going to want to use it again. You're going to want to make more and reuse the container. But once you pour it all out, uh, refill the container with 70% isopropyl alcohol and shake it up. And so that residue inside is going to mix with the alcohol and make you a really nice silvery wood stain. Now I just put everything on a pad of paper towels. Go over it with my stain. Someone online asked me uh, what the difference was or what my preference was between the alcohol and shoe dye or the alcohol and India ink. And you get really similar results with either stain. But um, with the, uh, the shoe dye, it's less likely to get uh, granular. Might have a problem with the India ink. Over time, the stain uh, becomes kind of granular. If you've made any and used it yourself, you probably know what I'm talking about. You've seen that happen. But this stuff uh, doesn't tend to do that. So, Plus, it comes with this... Uh, Nifty applicator makes applying stain really super fast and easy. Don't want to forget the MDF parts too, at least the uh, parts of them that are going to show. Now when that stain is dry, I like to come back. It's going to be raw wood like this. I'm not going to paint this structure. It's just I want it to be, you know, raw weathered wood. Uh, I like to use my watercolors with a mixture of burnt sienna and cobalt blue. And I don't mix up a whole bunch uh, at a time. I just, just, just mix up just what I need, just a little bit. Add some water to it and mix them together, and you get a nice silvery gray. And the reason I don't mix up a whole bunch at once is because I want there to be variation. I want, you know, sometimes I want the gray to be warmer with some more burnt sienna. Sometimes I want it to be cooler with the cobalt blue. And here you can see the difference between the two. This one I just finished doing. And this one is just the regular stain. I'll come back with a small brush, a soft brush, and pick out individual boards. And the whole idea here is just to create variation. If you've never tried watercolor weathering, I uh, highly recommend you give it a try. It's easy to do. Some people hear watercolors and they think, oh, that's difficult. I, I won't be able to do it. It's really super easy. If you can apply stain, you can do this. Before I start putting the walls together, I want to go ahead and trim out the doors and the windows with my 1x4s. I've got some tight bond wood glue to do that. Just makes it a little bit easier to trim these out before the walls are assembled. With this cabin, it look pretty rough hewn, so I'm not taking a lot of uh, precise measurements. I'm just kind of eyeballing all of the cuts. 
these windows are not going to be glazed. This is a real rough and ready kind of cabin. So there's not going to be any glass in the windows. There's going to be wooden shutters. Also want to add a, a Z brace to the door. Usually with Z brace doors, um, you want to have this part of the Z <laughs> on the side that opens. Oops. Though I have seen them done the other way. I've seen them done both ways. But a carpenter told me that to go that way. So I'm going with what the carpenter said. There are two types of shutters, like I mentioned, and these side opening shutters, I can just glue those right to the window frames. And then I can add the little brace boards once they're in place. Now I have the walls just about done. I'm going to cut some floor joists to brace up the bottom of this. And this is some O scale 6x8 stock that I'm using. Now I'll uh, distress and stain all these like I did the rest of the walls. Start with this front wall that just slots right down in here, like so. And then the side wall slots in also and fits into the notch in the front wall, like that. And then I want to also add some additional bracing at all of the interior corners with uh, some 1 8 inch square stock or 6x6 in O scale. Now this end wall fits a little bit differently. It actually fits down over the edge of that uh, floor. Give that a good finger clap for a minute or two. And now the fourth and final wall is going to slot in between these other two. I have the interior corner bracing. Starting to look like a shack now. Now I can trim out all the exterior corners with some 1x6. Covers up those tabs and slots and gives it a nice finished look. Now I want to create some interior walls so that when people you know, look in through these windows, this is going to be wide open, there's no glazing, so I can't fog it, there's no curtains or anything, so I've got to figure something else out. And when people look in through these windows, I don't want them to just see an empty box. So I'm creating some false walls that will go in here. And they'll also act as lighting baffles, because I am going to have a light in here. So the light will be more intense out of some windows than others. And this is some uh, 16th of an inch thick plywood that I've stained up. It's scribed with uh, nine inch boards. And right now, I'm gonna add some little decor, a little decor to the walls. I'm gonna add some wanted posters on here. I like the idea that these outlaws are so vain <laughs> that they, uh, collect their own water and posters and put them up on the walls as souvenirs. Make those edges disappear. Now I can glue that in. All right. Like that. And then I've got a second wall to go right there. Now I've got a figure that I want to add to the interior. 
This little guy is from Knuckle Duster Miniatures. He's a 28 millimeter outlaw figure. And I just love these guys. Um, show you how I paint them real quick. I always start with the flesh tones. And to make up a convincing flesh tone, I use some burnt sienna and uh, some white or light tan, unbleached titanium in this case. Flesh tones are usually a lot uh, redder, ruddier than you think, especially for these guys that, you know, they're outlaws. They, they live outside most of the time. Now the 28 millimeter figures are a little small for O scale. These guys are all a little short, but that's okay. As long as I don't mix them with other, you know, larger O scale figures, it uh, should work just fine. Next, I'll do his shirt. And for that, I'm using some uh, antique white. I don't believe that I mentioned that I primed this guy first. Left out an important step. I primed him with some um, Rust-Oleum dark brown, dark brown camo, which is very ultra flat. This is a uh, double zero brush I'm using. These knuckle duster castings are just a pleasure to paint, pleasure to work with. For his vest, I'm going to use some of this English ivy. Give him a green vest. When I put paint on the brush, I'm putting paint just on the very tip of the brush. That's an important thing to, you know, when you're doing really fine detail work, you don't want to stab the brush down into the paint and get a whole bunch of paint on there that is going to be harder for you to control. Just a little teeny bit right on the end of the brush, right on the tips of the bristles. For his hair, I used some uh, apple barrel khaki because I wanted to have blondish, kind of dirty blonde hair. I paint that first because I'm going to get it all over the hat. And now I can come back and paint the hat and clean all that up. And I'm, for that I'm using some pavement, which is a dark gray. I want it to look like it was a black hat at one time, but it's, you know, it's kind of faded out. I use the same color for his uh, pants. For his gun belt and his boots, I'm going to use the primer color, that, um, that dark brown. But I'm going to dry brush a lighter tan over the top of it. This is some territorial beige, just to bring out the details. We got his boots and the spur straps. In fact, while I'm in here, I'm going to take some of that pavement, mix it with a little bit of this Unbleached titanium, lighten it up a shade or two. Get most of it off of there. And the dry brush his pants to bring out the wrinkles and stuff. Use the same on his hat. Now I've got some Vallejo gunmetal for his pistola. It's like a uh, Colonel Colt's single action 45 army model. I'm going to use the same color for his belt buckle and down here on his spurs as well. So now what I like to do is take, after the paint has dried for a few minutes, come back with a dark wash over the entire figure. This is just some uh, diluted black acrylic, and this is going to unify the whole figure and deepen the shadows, and just just really makes it look better, in my opinion. Create some shadows back there in those eye sockets where they would be. And for the final step, I will spray him with uh, a clear matte enamel finish, and that will protect the paint job and uh, make it less likely. Uh, to you know, rub off with fingers and things like that. Now I want to cut Billy off of his little stand. There. Get rid of that. Use some Eileen's tacky glue and attach him to a quarter-inch block of wood. There's a little bit more 
square and centered in the window when I put them in there. Just like in Hollywood, you know, the short guys, they got to stand on a box. <laughs> now I can glue them in here. He's pointing his six shooter out the window. That's what I'm talking about right there. Welcome to Bandit Canyon, folks. Now I can glue the rest of these roof trusses in. These have all got to line up just so. glue in all of these slots. Well, this is still somewhat flexible. Let's see if I can get these to all seat properly. It's always a bit of a challenge. Yeah. Went off without a hitch. This final truss overhangs uh, the front part of the porch. It has a little bit of a scribed cladding that goes on the front of it. I've got some antlers here, some deer antlers from uh, Weissman Model Services. I thought those would look pretty cool on the uh, front of the building there. So I'm drilling a little hole to receive them. Now this gets glued into this front notch and then that's supported by a pair of six by six posts. Now I want to create a set of supports for this side of the roof where this overhang comes out right there. And I've created a little quick and dirty jig here so I can uh, attach these 4x4 four four uprights to this 4x6 beam which is going to sit up here underneath the eaves. And I've got little tiny marks in here you probably can't see that tell me where to glue these on that will line up with the holes that I've already pre-cut in the, uh, the porch deck right there. Okay, now with any luck, I should be able to put the posts down into the holes and then slide this up underneath the rafters. I think that'll work. Well, I figured I might as well go ahead and finish all of this railing while I'm at it. Gluing some uh, two by fours on here, the scale three feet up from the bottom of the posts. Let's get this extra glue off of here. Pretty sure this is not OSHA approved. <laughs> I want it to look pretty flimsy, so that uh, you know, like breakaway railing in a in an old western movie where the bad guy gets shot and breaks through the railing and falls down into the horse trough. You know, that kind of thing. Now I can go ahead and glue these other shutters on. And I can just prop them open with a piece of 2 by 4 like that. All that's really left after this is the roof. <laughs> yeah, I like that a lot. All right, time to build a roof, I think. And for that, I'm going to use some chipboard. This stuff is about uh, 1 32nd of an inch thick, and it's ideal for this because it's flexible. And I want it to be flexible because the roof is going to have a built in sag to it. If you take a look at this, top ridge pole here you can see that I actually designed it and cut it with a bit of a dip in the middle of it. So now I've got my three roof panels, one for each side and one for the porch, and I just need to lay them on here and match up uh, that little dip. You can trace it and then cut it out. Now I want to 
flip these over and scribe some six inch wide planks into the underside. Then I like to use these uh, Minwax stain markers. Just uh, doing the parts that show here around the edges. The shade I'm using, the shade of stain is early American. Now brushing glue on the tops of each of these rafters along the edges of the building where they meet up and along the top edge of the roof panels. I can start putting these into place. And you know the important thing is to just Take your time, go slow. Don't try to rush something like this. I want this roof to look, you know, really funky <laughs> with lots of character. So I'm going to do the porch roof, I'm going to do it with corrugated iron. And this is some. Uh, Corrugated material from uh, Chris Bond at Full Circle Models. This is some brown cardstock. Right now, what I'm doing is dry brushing some uh, Apple Barrel Country Gray on the top, just hitting the tops of the corrugations. Brush some glue on here. I can start putting this on. Don't want them all to be uniform. Cut some of them a little bit uh, shorter than others. Overlap them a little bit. And bend some of them down. The main roof, I want uh, rolled tar paper roofing. And I'm using some black construction paper. But I'm not just using it, you know, out of the package. I've, I've painted it flat black. Now why would you paint black construction paper, paper black? Well, I'll show you in a minute. All right now I'm cutting it into some scale three foot wide strips. On this first strip I scored the bottom back, you know, maybe about four inches for where it overlaps the top of the corrugations. And one of the reasons I painted this black is so that when I rip it, like so, it will expose the lighter color underneath, just like on real tar paper. The other reason I painted it is, is because um, this construction paper is not very color fast. Uh, it, it will fade. I'm going to overlap this by about a foot or so. Push that down into the, the sway bag roof there. Now to cap the roof, take a final sheet and fold it over. Press it down so it matches the sway of the roof. I want this to be the kind of tar paper roof that is held held in place by battens. You often see this in the old uh, mining camps and logging camps. Just a quick and dirty way of uh, building a cabin. Not worried if some of them might be a little crooked. That's all part of the fun. Now I want some patches on here. Evidence of repairs. Now I want to add a uh, smoke jack or stove pipe coming out of the sidewall like that. I've got this uh, white metal casting. Put a little bend in it too to add a little bit of character. But I need to drill a hole in the wall right there.
I don't have any flashing for this stovepipe, but that just gives me the opportunity to uh, improvise one from some of this uh, leftover corrugated material. Here's, this is probably something those uh, outlaws would do. Use the tip of this hard lead pencil to indicate some, uh, some nails holding that on there. Now I need at least one guy wire to uh, help hold this stovepipe in place. A little piece of music wire here. Now I get to weather the heck out of this. Start with some colored chalks, some grays and blacks here on the roof. I'm going to blend all this together, make it look old and dirty and dusty. Now I'll switch to the pan pastels, punch up the rust on these uh, corrugated pieces. some on the stove pipe over here as well. All right, that's pretty good. I'll get a uh, clear matte finish on here. We'll be moving right along. Now I think the rest of the work on this I can finish over here on the layout. I've already installed a three millimeter yellow flickering LED that this can sit right down on top of. Had to run the wires back through all the rock work. Now I want to cut and install some uh, six by eight beams under here to have this cantilevered off the side of the cliff. A couple of angled braces are probably a good idea too. This looks like a good place for a water barrel. Well, maybe not a good place, but it looks good there. <laughs> Let me put it that way. I thought it might be kind of funny if someone was airing out their long johns. So I cut this out of some paper and painted it up. Good old red union suit. And I think the final detail today is going to be a ladder coming up from the catwalk down below. I want uh, all of these structures here and hole in the wall, Robert's Roost, to all be connected by uh, ladders and stairways and catwalks. And there it is, the outlaw cabin at Robert's Roost. so much for watching today. I hope you enjoyed the build. I certainly had a blast putting this together. If you did enjoy it, please, you know, like, subscribe, share, hit that notification bell if you'd like to see more from Thunder Mesa Studio. And you can also follow us over on Instagram at thunder.mesa and see what's happening on the Thunder Mesa Studio website at thundermesa.studio. As always, a huge shout out and thank you to the Patreon members who helped to make these videos possible. Until next time, keep moving forward, my friends. Adios for now.